Hello and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'll be discussing Rhythm of War by Brandon Sanderson, the fourth book in the Stormlight Archive. Now, I could literally talk about the Stormlight Archive and even just this book probably for hours, uh, so I'm going to try to keep this from being an overly long video. Um, really, I just want to focus on some big things, but get into it with some more spoilers. So I did do a spoiler-free review, so if you've not yet read the book, I'll link down to that video. You can definitely watch that one. This one, though, I will be discussing spoilers, some quite big. So definitely do not watch this if you've not read the book, and go, go read the book. It's been out for enough time. You should read it. <laughs> so with that, there is, like I said, a ton to talk about. And really from the opening, I was pretty hooked and really happy with the direction that it seemed like where the war was going to go. We have the prologue where we got to see Navani's point of view uh, for the night of Gavilar's assassination, and it really showed us more what we'd had hints at, that they had a very strained relationship, and that he was not exactly very nice to her and put her down and is a big part of her and why she never really thinks she will amount to anything, but just that she can help others. This was a really important point of view that already existed technically in the world, but seeing that really set the basis for a lot of the time that we would spend with Navani and is a big part in the first really building block of turning a character that was just kind of there into a very important main character in book four. Sanderson is just so good at doing that and so we spend a lot of time with Navani and her self-doubt while also actually being an amazing scholar and all of the discoveries that she finds. We'll get a little bit more to her later. I do want to talk about just the very start though, the first chapter, and we have the epic reveal of Kaladin. And that was super nice just because I know a lot of people, myself included, thought there was a little lack of Kaladin in the last book, and so starting right off with Kaladin, even though he's going on a very different type of journey in this book, it was awesome just to see him and to get to have that really big reveal. His fight there with Mosh uh, once they get attacked by the other Fuse really is the thing that sets the tone for him. And although I hate Mosh so much, man, is the character of Mosh so well done and such a catalyst to Kaladin's changes. We then see the big sky ship coming in, and that right there was really, really cool. And as all of these little things showing that a lot has changed in the year from the end of Oathbringer to the start of Rhythm of War, and we start to see a more technologically advanced world very much on the horizon. The Fabrial scientists have made leaps and bounds, a lot of that because of what they've discovered at Urethuru, and that's even with them not yet understanding how Urethuru works, which is also a plot point that we take a look at. So, so many things changed, so many things in motion, and really just from the start, this book had a faster pace than Oathbringer did, and I think it really needed that. Our four main characters that we look at in Rhythm of War are Navani, and most of her important plot lines are in or through after it's been conquered by the Fused, and she's working with Raboniel to research to find potentially an opposite to Void Light, and then in turn Stormlight. We also spend time with Shallon, and with Shallon we see right off the bat she's kind of become a little bit more at peace with herself. She still looks at the personalities as distinct different people. They all kind of talk and agree on things, and so we see that improvement, but on the cusp of that there's another formless personality that is threatening to take over. Her main plot line takes place in Lasting Integrity, which is also where Adeline and some other Radiants go as well. We also have Venli, who's the biggest new addition, and we do see a lot of the Parsha idea in general, whether it's the Fuse, the Singers, or Venli, the last listener, and those parts I thought were very interesting, getting to take a look at this whole new different group that we've seen and we spent a little bit of time with, but that we haven't dug into a ton. And I think some of the slower parts in Oathbringer were really setting this up, letting us get to know and get to see how the singers act, how the fused act, and really setting up to have the bigger role. And I thought it worked really well for the most part. It really kind of changes the perspective of what we've looked at. That was, of course, a huge plot point in Oathbringer where we find out that 
Of course, the listeners and their ancestors were actually the original inhabitants of Roshar, and they were betrayed, and then they're the ones who are coming back to fight against humans who are the real Voidbringers. So that kind of whole shift, and then actually getting to see day-to-day -day how these people operate, that they're normal people, that they have ambitions, that they have flaws, I thought was really cool to see. And of course, we do get quite a bit of Kaladin, even though Kaladin's journey was so very different. And really his main focus was him dealing with battle fatigue, being removed from command and in these desperate situations in Urethuru after it has been conquered. So there was a lot going on there as well. The big plot lines for the most part we saw were in Urethuru once it's been captured by the Fused and is being held by the Singers. That's where we see Navani and Kaladin. I mentioned Shallan is in lasting integrity, and she's going with because the Ghostbloods have given her a mission to assassinate, who we find out is one of the Heralds. And Adeline is going along because it's his job to try to convince the Honor Spren to start sending more Honor Spren so that they can continue to have more Windrunner Radiance, so an important mission for him as well. We also, of course, have Venli, and her main plot lines is just trying to adapt to her life and really find a way out. We see her complex emotions. She's realized what she's done in bringing all this about, and she wants to continue on with being an Eye Radiant, even though she's afraid to tell anyone about it. And also, she really just wants to get some people and escape and just live like her ancestors did, who before left the Fused and just wanted to go on their own. Uh, seeing how that turns out as well later with her finding the, well, for one, Relaine, but then finding out the other listeners did survive, and that they were potentially led to safety by one of the Chasm Fiends, which uh, there was more in Don Shard, which I'm doing my video after this one because I read it after Rhythm of War, but uh, the relationship between Great Shells and Spren, uh, something I'll talk about a little bit more there, but there was, there was a lot that I thought worked really well there also. So, I want to talk about the things I really liked and the things I didn't like so much. There were definitely some of both. I thought for the most part most of the plot lines worked really well. There was one I mentioned in my spoiler free review I just found to be a little bit lacking. So first of all, Navani. The plot line for her and just her character in general was so well done and it's amazing how much you grow to care about Navani and you know feel for her even though she's been more of a side character up until this point. Getting to see her and her actually brilliant scholarly mind, even if she doesn't think so, was just awesome for one, because we already saw the airship, we already know all the things she's been working on. That's mostly she's always was bringing up new Fabrial designs and ideas back in, in the other books as well. But seeing her study and through her study, finding a lot more about the investiture known as Stormlight and Voidlight, and in turn, the Tower Light that the sibling uses, which is a combination of investiture from cultivation and from honor. So it makes it really interesting thinking more about it that we have Stormlight, which is from honor, and we have Voidlight, which is from odium, but we also hadn't really ever heard about Lifelight before, which is from cultivation, and it's mentioned here that that's actually what Lift is using. That's why we never see her actually using Stormlight, and she has the ability to metabolize it. She's actually using Life light, which is from cultivation. So learning about these different types of light and actually figuring out that since the sibling, the other spren that we'd heard about, actually uses a combination of storm light and life light, we get to see a ton more just about kind of the science and mechanics behind surge binding and investiture on Roshar, which is a lot more complicated than we really would have thought within the first couple of books. That's one of those things Sanderson has always been great at is the magic systems. And while the surge binding is already a pretty complicated system, really getting a look at how the investiture works and the fact that we know uh, how investiture works and how to transport it and do different things with it is a huge plot point in the Cosmere as a whole and from some bigger events that are happening on Roshar, I think that's gonna be very, very important. And the big thing is finding that creating the actual opposite of those types of investiture, those types of light, creates this huge destruction, which makes you wonder if that played into the destruction of Braze that led the humans to flee to Roshar to begin with. So potentially an even bigger reveal from the Vani's plot lines I thought were really, really well done. Talking a little bit more about Venli, I really did enjoy her passages. It was 
kind of familiar because she was going through a lot of what other characters have where they're trying to figure out their place in the world and it seems like that's definitely the the radiant thing radiants are those who don't and it was a really big part of it was her just thinking that she's really not worthy of her spren and she's really not powerful enough to do anything she's kind of just caught in the middle she's the last listener so some of the few just look at her as a traitor some of the singers do too others are kind of in awe because she was this person who came before them and was free and never enslaved as the parchment and so a lot of different things going on there also her learning how to actually do the stone shaping was pretty awesome and kind of talking to the rock made of the mountain of Urthuru and also seeing glimpses of the Dawn Singers in the past and that the Dawn Singers actually were able to do stone shaping a bit differently. That maybe was just something they all could do. So once again, playing into and giving us just a little bit more of the mystery of ancient Rosharan history, we found out a bit more here and there, but it's such a long time ago and with the desolations, it's gonna be probably a while before we really find out more. But I really enjoyed seeing that and then seeing her kind of step up moment where she decides what she's going to do, when she decides she's going to free lift and try to help the other Radiants to escape and eventually getting out going, like I said, finding the other listener people and finding out that they're actually going to become stone shapers as well, at least some of them, because those Spren have chosen that they won't bond with humans and only with the listeners. So that already sets up also a huge implication for the next book and beyond because of the fact that we're gonna have a new order of Knights Radiant that's exclusively listener and not humans. I'm gonna talk about Child last because that's the plot line that I, I had the most issues with. So I'll get into Kaladin now. I don't wanna wait quite till the end of the video for Kaladin because I, I do have a lot to say and I think his arc here was something really special and different and also honestly made me believe that Sanderson might actually kill him off. And you kind of have that feeling in the back of your mind, like there's no way one of the main characters is just going to be killed off. We had Yasna early on, but she ends up coming back as well, so it was okay there. And you, you think it's not going to happen, but with the way Rhythm of War took place and with the way that already an Oathbringer, Kaladin, was kind of starting to take a back seat to some other characters, it all started to click into place. Early on in Rhythm of War, he's taken out of command. He's trying to find an identity for himself somewhere else. And he goes back to working surgery with his father who had all moved to Urthuru. And he's doing that, but he still isn't really feeling like that's his purpose. He starts kind of a support group for others going through battle fatigue because there's no such thing as treating mental illness in this time, which is pretty reflective of in the past when it wasn't understood and nobody knew what to do. So you had kind of sanitarium settings where like, oh, we just throw them all in a dark room and kind of leave them there so they don't get excited. And so that continued to Brandon Sanderson's big theme of talking about mental health and talking about different issues and trying to kind of normalize it and make people see that it's, it's a normal thing people deal with and uh, showing these characters also as more than just their mental illness. So you add that as well, but still really he's struggling to find his place. And after Urthru is conquered and taken over, he knows he has to fight, but he's really struggling to find the will. And he, in concert with the sibling and Navani, is trying to protect Urthru and keep Rabonio from going and completely corrupting the heart and making it so that it will completely prevent Radiance from doing anything. Uh, it's already, the way it's working now, has not pretty much all of them out, except for Kaladin, who's uh, close to the fourth ideal, we're told. And the Windrunners in general, since they have the Surge Adhesion, which is mentioned by Ravonial, is not a true Surge, not truly of honor, so already something interesting there, where that could be something that <laughs> plays in later, potentially, as well but that makes them a little bit more responsive. Eventually, Kaladin is able to wake up Teft and they're working on waking up the others. Lyft is still awake since she's not actually using Stormlight. She's not affected the same way either, though she still has some issue with some of her surges. But his whole arc of just trying to figure it out and then seeing Teft die. And, and that's always been the big thing for Kaladin is he can't stand to see people he feels like he could protect die. And you could really tell leading up to 
right. during the story that the fourth ideal for him at least was going to be accepting that there are those he can't protect that he can't protect everyone and that's always been the thing he could not get past and he just could never let that go and that seemed like an impossible edge for him to get to after seeing Teft killed by Mosh and not even just killed but just thrown into the middle of this room and Kaladin is just broken. Now to mention this comes after one of my favorite Kaladin scenes in the series in general where he's fighting the pursuer and it's just this completely badass thing going on and he's telling him he should be afraid of him and that they're gonna never call him the pursuer again and he's just completely like mentally just destroying his opponent because he knows he's not strong enough to beat them physically this amazing scene Calvin is really rising to the occasion and then Teft thrown dead at his feet and he's just completely broken and even Mosh tells the others don't attack him or he'll go into a rage right now he's he's too broken he's gonna not get over this and that's as good as winning uh, they do end up attacking him and he goes to fight they end up taking his father and throwing him off the edge of the, the top of the tower and Kaladin he's been at that brink before with the honor chasm but this time he jumps he knows he doesn't have his powers and he can't get far enough to use them and he jumps fully intending to just let go finally and we have Dalinar uh, coming from the battlefield and Emil with the Stormfather trying to slow time, trying to talk to him, tell him to say the words and it's just not enough and he just can't. And I, I honestly, I believed that Sanderson was gonna kill him and for Sanderson to make me believe that is really impressive just because it goes against that whole instinct of no, can't kill main character, can't kill main character. Just phenomenal, that arc. And of course, it ends up being him and a vision talking to Tien, which we're led to believe is at least somewhat real that he's in the spiritual realm talking to him, and he's able to swear his ideal, and we get that moment we've been really waiting for uh, the whole book, and since the last book when we thought he was going to swear his fourth ideal, and it is pretty awesome, of course, him and his new armor, him fighting, and it just was very, very good, uh, very enjoyable in general to see. Uh, it was so well done, and like I said, just making me think he was actually going to be killed. I, I still can't believe that I actually thought it, but after Tef died, I'm just like, oh no, and I couldn't stop reading because I had to know what was going to happen. So getting off of some of the highs, there were some things that just didn't land for me, and the big one really was Shallon. And Shallon, in Words of Radiance especially, really picked up as the character that I really enjoyed reading. And she was really good in Oathbringer as well, and had a lot of that internal conflict. We start here in a better place, but still kind of pointing to Formless, who is trying to make sure that Shallon does not remember the final things that she has been forcing out of her memory. That's the truth she needs to say to say her next ideal. And throughout the trip, we kind of see this roundabout way and we never really end up getting to it uh and we get to the end where finally it's she needs to admit it and she just says no i'm not going to do that and kind of just takes over and pushes them aside but we do get the feeling that maybe we didn't really know shallon maybe there is another personality that's her true personality that we've never actually seen and so it was still interesting but it just didn't really get to where I thought. It seemed like the, the book was very much leading up to the big reveal, and then it just said, nah, yank the rug right out from under you. But I will say with the character of Shallon and her emotional state, it didn't make sense that she'd still be unwilling to admit it. And I also kind of, in a way, like the fact that, you know, we expect the fourth ideal, so doing it, it kind of also, it would have been doing the expected. So I can definitely respect not having it, but still it just felt like it was really leading to it and then it didn't happen. So that kind of just made that plot line feel a little bit more bland to me. However, we do get a ton of information about the ghost bloods through Shallon as she's working with them and told she'll be a full member after she kills the Herald. And we find out a ton more about them, that they're most certainly not from Roshar and that they are heavily involved in potentially things all over the Cosmere, and that their main goal is to find a way to transport investiture from Roshar, where it's very, very easy to get and contain gemstones, and take it to other Cosmere worlds where it can be potentially used 
and make them very, very rich and powerful uh, by having a form of investiture that's so easy to get to others when many of the other worlds it's much, much harder. You know, for example, on Skadrill, you have to actually eat metal, you have to burn it off, you can't just store that energy, it's a very finite thing. And then if you go to, for example, Malthus, where it's breaths, and it's a lot harder to collect than just waiting out in a storm. So it makes a lot of sense and is really interesting. And that played into a ton of the overall Cosmere effects as well. We saw really with this book, it was moving in a really, really big way toward being very much about the Cosmere as a whole and no longer just for Ashar. And I really think that's a calculated risk on Brandon Sanderson's part, because for those who are very Cosmere aware and really big on looking at all of the details, there were a ton of little Easter eggs, things here and there. But in Rhythm of War, a lot of it was brought to the forefront in a really big way. We see more, and, and you already could, could guess from before, once again, if you're Cosmic Aware, that Zahil was Vasher and that uh, Azur was Vivenna. But we actually see Zahil using Awakening uh, very, very bluntly and openly about it. We have Hoid slash Wit talking a lot more about the Cosmere as a whole. And we really get it a lot more obvious references to the Cosmere, and so it's one of those things where I feel like if you're not a full Cosmere reader, if you're not into all of the rest of it, you may not get quite as much out of this book, but when you are, it really elevates it that extra level, because there's so much more going on. Uh, you have the letters back and forth in the epigraphs too, which are really interesting to read, where you have Hoyd talking to different uh, shards, and it really also sets the stage for the very ending, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, because there's still some other things I want to mention, just some, some honorable mentions or type things that I really enjoyed. Uh, one of them was Adeline, and even though his plotline also kind of went in a really predictable way, and that did happen, his whole going to lasting integrity and having the trial, and you could just tell that Maya was going to like wake up and save the day, and she did, but I think that for one, the first half of the book before that happened really made Adeline a character that I liked so much more, and I really enjoyed reading all the different things he was doing, and a lot of it's just him being such a good guy. He was presented very differently early on in the first couple of books, and you see him really grow, let him, his real self out, and he's really dealing with uh, basically not being a main character anymore. That's kind of his whole arc, is he, he was a main character, in the time of Way of Kings. He was very important, and he kind of saw pretty quickly the world was moving very quickly around him, and he wasn't nearly as important anymore. He's not a search binder. He decides he doesn't want to be king of Alethkar, and he's really just moving into a more supporting cast role, but supporting others is something he jumps into wholeheartedly. We see his conversations with Kaladin where he's really trying to just make him feel better and help any way that he can, even in these just kind of little moments. And there were some scenes early on that reminded me of the set pieces in Words of Radiance, where it's this innocuous scene. They're just sitting in a tavern and drinking and having a good time, but it did so much for developing the character. And we see with how he is honestly worried and just wants to help Shal and wants to help Kaladin and knows that they struggle and just wants to be there to help. And with the trick to lasting integrity too, this is kind of his spot. He's like, here's, here's where I'm going to be a main character again. And he comes to realize, no, that's not really the case. It doesn't really matter what he says or does. The honor spring are really set and they're not planning on listening to a word he says. The whole trial he finds out is a sham. And so he realizes this once again, this isn't for him. It's not, it's not something he's going to be able to do. So he steps back, he lends his strength to Maya, and he lets her be the one who actually causes the honor spend to be like, oh no. And with it too, it was really cool. Even though you knew that she was going to kind of wake up and probably say something, uh, it was a cool moment. And I liked the little tidbit that those Spren, who were with the original Radiance at the Recreants, they actually, with the Radiance, decided together to give up the oaths, knowing what would happen to them. So that also makes you wonder if there was something else at play there, uh, more than just they were worried about surge binding because they found out the secret because that whole kind of earth shattering event, which makes you wonder if there's more there, but it was still a cool moment. And I think it's 
honestly, it was Sanderson really sticking to not everyone's going to just be a radiant. And that was something, too, in Don Shard, I'll talk about there with Risen, I really enjoyed that. You don't need every character every to be a main character. You don't need every character to be a radiant. There are regular people, too, and that's really what Adeline is in that supporting role, and he just does it really, really well. And so I actually liked his character a lot more in this book, even though he was really doing less, just because of the way that he was written. Uh, so a few other things I do want to mention is it was really cool seeing uh, Sil POV and a Sa Anat POV where we start to really see the spren and how they think and their awareness. We've known, of course, that they are aware of what's going on around them. But seeing those other looks, I really liked as well. And of course, I don't want to forget to mention Dalinar and Yasna and their plotline on the battlefield with Teravangian and Seth there as well. There were some really cool moments there, even though that was very much more of the side plot. That also set up some of the really big things to come at the end. We got to see Dalinar in his new role, and Seth still trying to figure out his way. We did see with him that he's told by his friend, who doesn't always reveal himself to him, since, of course, he doesn't use it as a shard blade, even though he technically probably could, because he has Nightblood, tell him that soon he'll need to leave and he'll need to go his own way and swear his fourth ideal. So that was interesting there. Seeing Teravangian interact with Seth and with Dalinar and with Yasna and everyone was really interesting. And we got a bit more Yasna as well, and we got to see her in her glory as the potentially first person to have sworn the fourth ideal, uh, learning to use her armor, fighting on the front lines, and trying to really become the queen that she wants to be. So there was a lot of setup there. It, it definitely wasn't like it was an afterthought. It just, to the story of Rhythm of War, that plot line, the battle on Emil, was a lower scale thing. And in the plot, it was literally designed to distract them from her through. So, yeah, checks out. But it still was interesting. And it set up the, the final, actually, kind of confrontation that we're going to see probably early on in Book 5. And that was Odium actually agreeing to a contest of champions with Dalinar. We know Dalinar is intending to be his own champion, and we're interested to see who Odium is going to choose. But all of that is thrown out the window by the most jaw-dropping thing, and I absolutely did not see coming. But we had some more Terrafanchian POVs, and he figured out that not only was Odium afraid because he couldn't see Renarin's future, and he couldn't tell the future of those around him, like Dalinar, kind of a big one, and also that he was afraid of Nightblood. And we see this moment where Odium's pulling him into a vision on probably his dumbest day yet. Seth is there confronting him, trying to figure out what Teravangian is trying to do. He knows he's trying to manipulate him. And Teravangian takes Nightblood, draws it, and kills Odium, and takes his place. So, for one, that's just insane. It's Odium, who not only has really been the big villain that's been being set up since the first book, but also was seemingly being set up to be the biggest villain in the Cosmere, wanting to take over or destroy all the other shards and become the one god. Seeing that that character, that shard, destroyed and dead, and now it's Teravangian, that changes literally everything. And it's such a bold move to do in book four, and it really makes me just, any anything I thought that was gonna happen in book five, anything that seemed to, that event just kind of tossed everything on its head for me, and I was just shocked, and it was just, it was so good. <laughs> that moment, uh, there, there haven't been a lot of big reveals like that that I can think of in Stormlight, and just kind of in general. It was really, really cool to read, but, also, a bigger thing that happened with it is we saw that Nightblood, since it drains Investiture, can kill a shard. And makes you wonder, is that what Nightblood was always created for? Brandon had always been a little bit coy about Nightblood in general and saying that the people who created it knew about shard blades and did it kind of in its image. So we knew that. We knew that it, it used investiture, but actually seeing that and realizing that that's probably the use it was intended for also opens up so many more avenues for how Nightblood could be used and makes it just even more important in the series as a whole. So just a ton going on there. And then also we had Wit slash Hoyd who was actually being a little bit more open about things in this book 
and seeing him at the end being confronted by Teravangian, realizing it's not the same Odium, and Teravangian potentially erasing some of his memories by destroying some of his breaths. You don't know the way it's, it's written. It's very carefully written to make you unsure if he's faking it or not, but if he loses his memories when he's the one who's been since the very beginning working on his own plots and plans, that too could effectively flip everything we've read so far on its head. So just a tumultuous end to book four, and I just don't want to wait for book five. I want to read book five now, and I know I'm going to have to wait probably two years. It might drive me a little bit crazy, but I honestly am just at the point where, like I said, there were a few things that were kind of meh in this book, and in Oathbringer 2, there were some slower parts, but the ending was done. This one, there was just so many revelations, so many big things that also happened and set up for book five that I just, I have no doubt that Brandon's going to stick the landing with the first half here with book five before taking a break. And it just really, like I said, makes me just wonder what on earth is going to happen in the back half of the Stormlight Archive and how is this all going to affect the rest of the Cosmere as a whole. So really just a crazy, crazy ending. And like I said in my non-spoiler review, this book did not let me down at all. Uh, I know in book five, I'm sure we'll actually see Shallan move forward in some interesting ways as well. And maybe she won't move forward, maybe she'll go in a completely different way. It's hard to tell. But book five is, it was always gonna be my most waiting for book, but it's even more so after finishing Rhythm of War just made me really, really hungry for more. So I am excited to finally get to it. So I know there's a few things I can already think of that I forgot to get to in this video. I know there's just a ton more. Like I said, I could talk for hours about Rhythm of War and the Stormlight Archive in general, and there's plenty to talk about, but I'm gonna end the video here, I think, before it goes overly, overly long. It's already pretty long, but I'll end here, and I really do wanna hear your thoughts. What did you think of Rhythm of War? I watched a few other reviews here and there just to see what other people were thinking, and I found I disagree on some things and agree on some things with people, so I really would like to hear your thoughts about any of the things that I talked about, things that I didn't talk about. I uh, would love to hear it down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, then feel free to give it a like, and if you want to see more content like this, then feel free to subscribe. Also, I want to know, if you're still watching at this point, do you want to see a summary of Rhythm of War like I did for the other books. A lot of people viewed those, so I don't know if it was just to read Rhythm of War, which is kind of why I made them, or if people would be interested. So if you're still watching, dedicated enough, let me know in the comments if you do want to see a summary. I won't probably do it unless I actually see people wanting it, because that takes a lot of time. Anyway, that is the end of the video. Once again, feel free to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this.